Hello, I'm Tim Smith, and welcome to another Monuments Monday. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the subjects that were brought up by our viewers. So we have some questions here. Top fan Timothy York asked a question. Do you notice that the top fans are getting, you know, the attention early on here? How many regiments have more than one monument to mark the different places where they fought? Wow. I guess that would depend upon how you count. And I would have to go through and count them individually. One of the issues with that is that we have a, a number for regimental monuments, and we have a number for secondary position markers. So you think I could just add them together and maybe that would work. But the problem with that is um, that many of the units have more than two. Like for instance, the 95th New York has a regimental monument and then there are four secondary position markers. So that's why you have to go through it individually to see the way you ask the question, how many regiments have more than one monument? I have to, I'd have to sort it out. But according to the most recent count of monuments, markers and tablets that I have, which was done by my good friend Fred Hawthorne, licensed battlefield guide, there are 1,781 monuments, markers, and tablets in and around Gettysburg or associated with the Gettysburg campaign or battle. Um, he says that there are 336 primary regimental monuments and there are 96 secondary position markers. Of course, again, it's a little odd depending how you count. Like, is an advanced position marker a secondary position marker? So, uh, again, it would depend how you, depends how you ask. Glenna Linville asks, why is the General Reynolds Monument, Chambersburg Street, not located closer to the monument where he was killed? Um, I'd imagine that the General Reynolds equestrian statue was placed on the Chambersburg Pike where it was in a very prominent place for incoming traffic on the Lincoln Highway uh, to, you know, um, see General Reynolds. And it was kind of a, um, one of the first things that many visitors to Gettysburg uh, saw. And it's, it's quite impressive along that uh, uh, place. You might not know this, but uh, General Reynolds arrived at Gettysburg, uh, rode to the Eagle Hotel. Buford was not there. He learned General Buford was at the seminary building. He rode to the seminary building, um, met with General Buford, and then Reynolds and Buford rode out to the Chambersburg Turnpike and stood very near the spot where the equestrian statue is today. And then um, Reynolds rode back, uh, you know, told Buford to hold out, um, retrieved the first Army Corps that was coming up the Emmitsburg Road, helped them find a way across the fields south and west of the town, rode back out to the first day's battlefield, rode back out to the Chambersburg Pike at that location, and was there a second time, and then um, rode over to the spot where he was eventually killed. So Reynolds was actually at the location where his equestrian monument sits today. Leon Bogdan asks, in general, how accurate are these monuments placed on the field to actual engagement sites by those who dedicated them? That's a great question. Uh, um, I, I think in some cases you have to have, you have to take the placement of the monuments with a grain of salt. And, you know, a lot of the monuments the locations for them was um, uh, 
established by a party of veterans that were coming back to the battlefield 25 or 30 years later to mark the spot of where something happened for 15 or 20 minutes 25 years ago in their lives. So, you know, I guess you could make the argument that it was something that these men would always remember for the rest of their lives and they never forget every detail of what happened. Or you could say that they don't remember at all and a lot of times they're just guessing as to the placement of the units. Um, in the early days of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, when the monuments were being placed, they had a, a committee that approved the location of the monuments. And there were lots of different fights between the veterans. There were, um, uh, you know, times when a monument was placed and then another group of veterans came in and said, hey, that unit was not there. And there were movements of monuments at different times based on these arguments. So, I mean, it is a fair question. I just think that it's almost a case-by-case -case basis. And some of the monuments, we have excellent documentation that that's exactly where these things happened. And others were not so sure about it all. So, uh, we'll, we'd have to examine that in a further video. Jed Nouse asks, out west of the town, at the intersection of Buford Avenue, Wadsworth Avenue, and Reynolds Avenue, there's a large cement foundation. What was that, or what is that? Was it a well, a house, or a former monument location? So the field behind where the concrete, concrete slab is located that you're talking about um, was the site of an airport during the 1920s up through the 1940s. And the concrete slab sits where the office of the Gettysburg Airport was. I haven't looked at it in a while, but on our YouTube page, um, John Banaszewski uh, does a video about the Gettysburg Airport. He speaks about that building and actually shows a picture of the building that sits right at that location. So um, check that out, and I think that'll answer your, your, your question very well. Rick Kelbel asks, the monument you were standing in front of has a left flank marker, but no right flank marker. Why? I assume because it would be in the middle of the road because that is where it was or because the road is wider now. That's a great, great observation. So, so um, when I filmed the video asking uh, the viewers to submit questions, I was standing in front of Lewis Heckman's battery, Battery K, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. And yes, there is a left flank marker, but no right flank marker. And, you know, I don't know if I ever really thought about that. There are lots of missing flank markers or I shouldn't say lots, but there are missing flank markers around the field uh, to various units. And um, I started to look at some of the sources that I might have that would tell me, um, you know, when that marker was removed. And um, I couldn't find anything in our records that shows the flank marker actually being there. I do suspect, as um, Rick asked or, and mentioned in his comment, that the flank marker was probably eliminated when uh, Carlisle Street at that location near the Gettysburg College was widened and they probably didn't have room for it. Also, it is possible um, that the right flank marker was much farther away on the other side of Carlisle Street where there are now buildings and that that flank marker disappeared at the time of the construction of some of those buildings um, along uh, Lincoln Avenue, or Lincoln, uh, East Lincoln. Now, um, what's really interesting also is the fact that when you read the account of, of uh, Heckman's battery, it appears 
uh, from the official report and early maps that the battery was actually on the east side of the Harrisburg Road and not on the west side where the monument and cannon is today. So um, there's a little bit, bit of question about this. I can tell you this. Roy Frampton wrote a comprehensive listing of all the monuments on the battlefield that was uh, completed in 1987. He's a licensed battlefield guide. And he includes maps that shows every monument, every flank marker. And it was not there in his book in 1987. So I have no idea when it disappeared. Connie Parker Allen asks, hi Tim, what supporting units that were not actually active on the field of battle have monuments on the battlefield? That's a good question. And I think that, you know, she might be referring, the, the one that people often refer to is the 84th Pennsylvania Infantry. It was a unit that was part of the Army of the Potomac as the third, you know, part of the Third Army Corps. Um, and they have a monument at the Pennsylvania Monument. It's on the, uh, right near the Pennsylvania Monument. And it actually even has flank markers where their right and left flank were located. But that unit was guarding the trains of the Army and was in Westminster, Maryland. I'd imagine that because they were part of the Army of the Potomac and all the other units in the Army of the Potomac have monuments on the Gettysburg Battlefield, uh, that you know, they, it became natural for them to want to place a monument there. Um, they probably pl have flank markers because that was probably the rule at that time that every Pennsylvania regiment putting up a monument must also put up uh, flank markers, even though they were technically uh, at that location. I should point out the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment um, has a monument near the intersection of Buford Avenue and Springs Avenue, but they were not there during the battle. Their action occurred on June 26th out at Marsh Creek, you know, three miles west of Gettysburg. So that was kind of a unit that um, monuments kind of an odd placement. The 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry was not mustered into service until late July 1863, but their regimental monument is along the Baltimore Pike near the spot where George Sando was killed. Now, George Sando was a member of Robert Bell's Adams County Cavalry, a militia unit during the Gettysburg Campaign. And he was killed in the fighting there at that location. And then that particular militia unit later became part of the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry, and so then that unit, for whatever reason, has a monument on the Baltimore Pike alongside the monument where George Sando was killed. And so that one makes less sense to me than any of the others we just talked about. And then, you know, you could think of things like uh, Albert Wilson, the last surviving veteran of the American Civil War. He died on August 2nd, 1956, at age 106. Some people say 109. I think he himself said he was 109, but I think he's 106. He, um, although he has a monument on Cemetery Ridge honoring him as a last surviving Union veteran, he was not present at the Battle of Gettysburg. So I think that's the kind of thing I, I think uh, she was asking about. Wally Gordon asks, could you give some history on the Alabama Monument? Interesting. So in 1917, the Virginia Memorial was dedicated. In 1929, the North Carolina Memorial was dedicated. And in 1933, the Alabama Monument was dedicated. It was November 12th, 1933. And it's quite an impressive state memorial. Um, the Alabama Monument shows uh, the spirit of the Confederacy, or according to a few newspapers, the spirit of Alabama. Uh, uh, protecting a wounded Alabama soldier and urging another on. And, you know, uh, people, it hasn't gone unnoticed that uh, one of the soldiers 
looks similar to George Washington, alluding to the Civil War as being a second America, American Revolution. Um, also, I should mention that the monument was actually designed by a uh, man from Frederick, Maryland. I think his name was uh, Joseph Turner. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I often stop in front of the Alabama Monument with a bus group because there's a little pull out there. And of course, you can set up the attack of the Alabamians on the round tops that you can see in a distance. But I do have trouble stopping there with eighth graders. Um, uh, you know, since Beavis and Butthead's come out, uh, you know, eighth graders are really hard to deal with on the battlefield. Another interesting thing about the Alabama Monument that I uh, appreciate is um, the fact that Elaine Bennis of Seinfeld would have a serious issue with this monument. Alabamians has an exclamation point at the end of it. Like we're all supposed to go around saying Alabamians. And you know, um, it's a monument. I don't really think it requires an exclamation point. Well, thanks again for watching our video. And if you like the content that we put up on a weekly basis on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe.